So rule five, we ask, how could life emerge from chemicals? How could this ever happen? And I am not going to give you a definitive answer. I don't have that and I would, uh, I would publish it if I did, okay? But I can show you some experiments and in the book I have seven of them. Seven experiments and experiments that recreate ancient chemistry, they seem to work better in making lifelike molecules. And I think that's the clue, the meta clue that we should pursue. So I don't have uncertainty, but in the book I have seven experimental clues and three of the clues involve three different places around the world. Two of them are underwater. Um, there's white smoker underwater vents and black smoker underwater vents. And then there's another place, surface hot springs. All three of these have properties that look like chemical labs, natural chemical labs, where experimentation could take place and life-like molecules could be made. So to see a black smoker in the real world, you'd have to dive to the bottom of the sea, but they have a chunk of it on display at the Pacific Science Center right there. There's my kid looking at it, so you can see the size. But you see that it looks like this, and um, Gala drew it like this, which is really cool. The black smokers are literally, they have black smoky stuff coming up through the vents. It's where the heat from inside the earth meets the ocean, the liquid that can flow, and it comes together. And uh, the, the thing about this is that when you have this flowing, you can have complex molecules coming out. Here's pyruvate, which biochemists would know as one of the central molecules of metabolism. It's made at black smokers. There's, of course, there's two different kinds. There's the white smokers, which are slightly different, and they have different properties, and they make other interesting molecules. But one of the things about these molecules is they look like natural chemical labs, these, uh, these places. For instance, at many of these places, you can find serpentinite. And it's called that because it looks like snake skin. And there's even, I think there's a boulder near Casey that has serpentinite, and you can go and look for it. The cool thing about serpentinite, when it's down under these conditions, and when it's exposed to a lot of hydrogen bubbling out from inside the earth, and a lot of carbon in the form of methane and or carbon dioxide, it can actually bring those two things together. In fact, the, this rock is good at producing more hydrogen, which can react with the carbon gases, and it can make, maybe it can chain them together. It can chain them together into structures like this. These are just carbon stu stitched together. But what they have is they have, um, they have different properties and they can do cool things. And so just from carbon and hydrogen and a little bit of oxygen, you can make a whole diversity of compounds. And especially if they interact with water, they can do something that's surprising. Now here is where I have a demo for you. Now just because I have this very reactive water chemical that here, I'm going to put on my goggles just to demonstrate safety here, okay? But um, what I have here is an orange molecule called fluorescine. And I've tested this before on a small amount, okay? I haven't scaled it up. So we'll see if this even works, okay? So if you look at this, this is an orange molecule. And then, let's see, let's see if I uh, see anything yet. Yeah, it's not dissolving yet because it just sits there on top of the water. Now I'm going to encourage it a little, okay? And eventually you see a little bit of the red going in. And I'm going to put it under a black light. Can you see that? It's a... Uh, um, I could turn off the, I see, I see that it's starting to glow. Let me, oh, that's a little better. So you see that glowing pattern, and if you can come up and look carefully at it, you can see that it's swirling. Well, I have to hold it up, oh, there we go. Thanks, Derek. You can see little swirls in it that are, that are forming. Okay, so an orange molecule that, grow, that glows green under black light. That seems like it should be from some kind of uranium part of the periodic table, right? But it just comes from carbon and oxygen to working together. So you have complex patterns when you have weird mixing with water, and these complex patterns can also make unexpected chemistry happen, like tiny bubbles that can hold reactions.
Each of them can act like its own little flask. So this is what fluorescein looks like. And you can make fluorescein in the lab, if you have a lab, by following this rule. But you probably don't have phthalic anhydride and resorcanol on your shelf in your kitchen. But if you did, I just want you to see that they're just carbon and oxygen together, and they're brought together with a metal, zinc. And that's the last ingredient that's in the smokers. The smokers have a lot of metals in them. So you could, you, you could do this if you had it, but what's better is you can purify it from someone who's already made it. So if you have these, you might even have some in your backpack right now, you have a source of fluorescein, and there is a way to extract the fluorescein from your fluorescent marker, and you can make that orange powder that I just put on top of the water there. So you can check out the way to do that there. And uh, so the, the thing about all this is that you can make a lot of things from carbon and oxygen that do surprising chemistry, especially when mixed with flowing water. And there are some experiments, and I'll talk about a lot more of the experiments in the book. So if we can ever do that, I'm not saying that I'm sure that we can, but if we can ever find out what the origin of the life was, what the original reaction that led to life was, that will actually be uh, good news for my book. Because my book argues a couple of things. First of all, that our planet's special, chemically gifted to produce life. My book also argues that Gould's tape of life is too extreme. That you can repeat the important parts of life if you rerun them again. And if we can take ancient chemistry and run it in our lab today and recreate it, that would mean it can be repeated and that would mean it can also be chemically predicted from the properties of the elements.